Um, first, I want to thank the IUC for inviting me and for giving me the opportunity to speak. And thanks also to the audience for listening to me uh, talk about food right before lunch break and all that stuff. I first want to quickly introduce myself. My name is Livia Boscarvin. My pronouns are she and her. I'm a PhD student in sociology at the University of Basel in Switzerland. I have a very interesting background, so I studied sociology, science of religion, and gender studies in Basel. I did my master's in development studies at the Graduate Institute in Geneva. And then I'm back in Basel for my PhD in sociology, but focusing on human animal studies. And last year I spent um, a semester at NYU as a visiting scholar at the Animal Studies Initiative. Um, second, after my introduction, I want to uh, dedicate my talk to uh, four individuals. First, the three Italian anarchists, Lucia, Francesca, and Tatiana. Uh, they have been convicted for actions against um, the high speed train stuff at the Kimonte site, construction site. And I also want to dedicate it to Janine Africa. Um, Janine Africa has been in prison for more than 30 years. She's part of a um, radical black liberation and radical environmentalist group from Philadelphia, from the MOVE. So community, and it's her birthday coming up next week. So I, I put her address there, and yeah, it would be great if you could show them some solidarity. So today I'll be talking about pork belly futures, macho meat, and environmental racism. So I'll talk about animals as food from the perspective of human animal studies. And even before I start my proper talk, I have a kind of a second disclaimer. I would like to include a short reflection on research and objectivity. As we all know that knowledge is situated, there is nothing such as neutral or objective knowledge, and that's why I want to situate my position myself and make my standpoint clear or explicit. So, as you see, well, I'm white, able-bodied, female. I come economically, I come from a very privileged background in Switzerland. Um, I have a Swiss and Italian passport, so I, hence I can travel um, free around the world, more or less, and I can work where I want to. Um, I myself have experienced sexist discrimination. I witnessed racist violence towards non-white people. I witnessed homophobia towards queer people also. I've seen how the state oppresses minorities, how um, he oppresses people without papers, how he oppresses activists. And I've also seen how in our society, and if I say our society, I may uh, talk about Switzerland, but I guess this also is true for neighboring countries such as France or Italy or Germany, so how in our society non-human animals are oppressed as well in great numbers. So I think it's important that we as researchers um, who have time, um, who, who, well, we can dedicate most of our time to reading, to writing, to think about what we're doing, that we also reflect on our choices when it comes to our, our study, uh, our disciplines, our research topics. Um, so we should ask ourselves why we're, we're studying what we're studying and with, with what goal we're doing that, right? Some of you might think, well, in my case, it must be clear. I'm surely doing human animal studies because I just love animals. That's not entirely true. I do human animal studies because I just not, not love animals, but I love liberation or I care about freedom of oppression. That's why also I want to engage um, with critical race theory, for example, it's not because I love black people or I love Latinos, but because I care about freedom from oppression. I do feminist theory not because I love women um, but, or queer people, but because I care about freedom from oppression. So um, I care about all these issues and then this care um, or well, this critical perspective is then of course reflected in my scholarship. I'm sure that most of you, if not all of you, chose the IUC uh, to study law or economics because you care, uh, because of the IUC faculty does care about the just economic system, about social justice, about the bias here, etc. They care about uh, critical knowledge, about productivity, yeah, and so do I. Yeah, so far from my positioning. So I hope that my seminar will introduce you to something that perhaps you haven't thought or haven't cared about before, but which is also interlinked perhaps with a lot of issues that you do actually care about. So, let's finally go to the end of my talk. I will speak for about 45 minutes, and then we have um, like 30, 40 minutes for discussion. And I would ask you to leave questions for discussion for the end. And of course, if you have a, like, a, a needed question of clarification, yeah, don't hesitate to ask me. 
So the ag outline is very straightforward. I will first give you an introduction to human animal studies, and then we'll be talking about animal <coughs> Human animal studies. Yeah, first, why should we care about animals in the first place, right? You might perhaps never think of them, but they are actually everywhere. And I want to illustrate that with that slide. So here on the left and on the right, you have some pictures illustrating non human animals within human society or how humans deal with other animals. And in the center, we have that illustration by an anarchist collective from the US it's called Crime Sync. Um, we have a link here on top if you want to download the picture. It's actually a, a poster. Um, so this illustration depicts the US capitalist society as a pyramid scheme. It's very detailed, I know. I have that poster in my bathroom, and every day I discover something new. Um, and last week, as I was thinking about my talk at IBC, I actually discovered that animals are also everywhere in the picture, and this didn't come up before. So we can go through that whole pyramid, focusing on animals, if we start at the top, we have the president, uh, Barack Obama, as his new society. And right below Barack Obama, where he's standing, we have an eagle as a national symbol. We go down the stairs, we have a, this office of a corporate CEO, who is actually just greeting the environment, if you see. He's calling somebody, just yeah, spilling gas or whatever. Um, so in his office, you have that frame picture, where you see a bear hunter. So we have a bear, and then we have a hunter sitting on a horse. We go downstairs, we have a lab, and lab, uh, you have mice in that lab, so we see a picture of the intersection. Uh, on the same floor, we have the courtroom, where someone is just in the middle and we again have an animal as a symbol for justice, perhaps. Downstairs, we have an office, um, where perhaps just a scene of sexual harassment is taking place, but next to the lady who's sitting there, we have a cup of coffee, and a lot of people put cows milk in their coffee, so animals are also there without being noticed. Um, downstairs, we have that uh, veterinary um, office, perhaps, and we see a pelican who has been a uh, victim or a sort of survivor of the noise bill. Downstairs, we have a shop where you can buy clothes, and lots of our clothes are made of animal hair or animal skin. And then we have that kitchen with a person preparing lunch. Um, we eat animals, animal flesh or milk or also their menstrual products, eggs. And then um, on the ground floor, we have dogs that are uh, used as military, trained as military dogs and police dogs as well. And then, I think, I think that's actually one of the most interesting things, um, we have a whole pyramid that is built uh, on that basement. So the whole society is built uh, on the left on resource extraction, on prisons, and prison labor, on well here is sweatshop, sweatshop labor, but we can also just generalize um, that picture for uh, exploitation of labor in the so-called majority world. I use the terms minority and majority world for to replace global north and global south. Because I think it's interesting to see actually that kind of Italy, for example, is one example of the minority world, we are actually in the minority and not in the majority, so we are actually the exception of the rule. Um, so we have a sweatshop in the majority world and a soft house. So the whole society is sort of built on the exploitation of um, non-human animals. So our animals are everywhere in our society and they're also little troublemakers. Um, animals can be the reason for cultural conflicts here on the right, I have a picture with the French, uh, two French flags. Um, it's a, that, that picture is on a rally, rally of the French nationalist xenophobic party Front National, and they have a rally, rally against um, Muslim ritual slaughter that they consider are bad. Why do they consume all products on animal exploitation such as foie gras? But of course, it's always easier to point to others. Um, and that yeah, goes on question their own consumption of animal products. Animals can be the reason for economic crisis. Here on the left, uh, we have a picture of a demonstration of dairy farmers. This picture was taken in 2012, and they're protesting in front of the European Parliament in Brussels against low milk prices. Animals can trigger health emergencies. Think of the bird flu. Animals can also be the subject of international dispute. Two years ago, uh, the International Court of Justice 
rumen that Japan must hold its current wind program in the Southern Ocean. For that, I have a picture there, it's a picture of the, the Japanese rain fleet. So, and the plaintiff was Australia, so it was Australia versus Japan and with New Zealand intervening. So, despite all these fascinating examples and actually the rich uh, influence, the heavy influence animals have on our daily lives, social sciences have largely ignored the importance of animals for our society. But now, this new field of research is emerging, which is called human animal studies. Um, human animal studies examine that societal relationship with other animals, which, as you can see in all these pictures, yeah, manifests itself in a variety of ways. We can even have one animal, uh, think of a rabbit, that in different societal contexts is treated uh, completely differently and also applies different legislation. So if you have the rabbit, the rabbit can be a pet and live with a family. A rabbit can be used uh, in vivisection. A rabbit can be used in animal assisted therapy. And a rabbit can be hunted. A rabbit can be bred for her or his meat, or a rabbit can also be bred for his fur. Um, a rabbit can also be culturally, of course, a symbol for a Christian, Christian Easter holiday or just for fertility in general. Right? Um, so, as you can imagine, human animal studies is just a huge field to investigate. Um, so, animal studies have been blooming in the last decade. Here we have a graph depicting the upsurge of human animal um, of public publications on human animal relationship. I have it from the most reliable source uh, from Facebook. So, if you refer to academic papers, always go on Facebook. Um, and the graph shows the numbers of the publications listed in Google Scholar using the search term human animal relationships. Of course, the design of that study might, might be flawed, there might, not, there might be a lack of selection prepared, etc. etc. I think still the graph is telling and the growth seems to be astounding. Um, the so called animal theory in science has really infected uh, a large range of disciplines. Perhaps the most obvious one is philosophy with animal ethics. Here we can um, speak of scholars such as Katie Singer or also Martha Nussbaum or Jacques Derrida. Um, animals are also appearing in law, and this might be interesting for you, some of you do know. Um, animal law is a huge field from comparing legislation regarding animals in different countries to WTO laws, to the philosophical questions. Um, such as the question of property, because animals are considered uh, property in law, what does this mean, um, can this notion of property evolve, should animals have legal rights, if yes, which, right, which rights, if yes, like which animals should have rights, are rights back to personhood, what does personhood mean anyways, etc, etc, etc. In the US there are currently more than 150 law schools that have a program of courses on animal law. And recently, Harvard founded its um, Animal Law and Policy Program, and at the University of Basel, at my university, we just concluded the first PhD program on animal law in Europe. Um, animal uh, legal scholars, and for example, Gary Fritzsche, uh, who's going to show here, or Stephen Weiss, also my former professor, Anna Peters, she's now at the Max Planck Institute in Heidelberg. In political theory, uh, um, scholars are also thinking about a human animal relationship. We have, for example, Bill Kimlicka, who has developed a theory of animal citizenship. In sociology, you have theoretical and empirical studies that examine the human animal relationship, be it, for example, empirical studies on the attitude of slaughterhouse workers, how they cope with violence, or be it how to integrate animals in critical theory with Adorno and Hawkeimer, for example or studies on the animal liberation movement as a social movement. Uh, we can also mention scholars like Marvel Lemena, I show her book as decided here, or David Nagar, his book on animal oppression and human violence. Gender studies inform us about the connection between sexism and the oppression of animals. And I will talk about that later. Um, as scholars you can mention, for example, Cal Jayans or Greta Gar. Post-colonial studies and sociology, sociology of race investigate, um, for example, how domestication went hand in hand with settler colonialism, or how um, racism is underpinned by our treatment of other animals. I will come back to that later as well. I just want to mention the book Dangerous Crossings by Jean-Claire uh, uh, Kim, 
and Sister Deacon by uh, Dr. Grace Parker. They're both US uh, scholars. And if you're, doing, if you're interested in doing research on any of these subjects, I'm happy to talk with you about that later on. Um, I myself am doing sociology, and we can call it well, an environmental sociology as I do political ecology. So, let's move on to the second issue. Um, here uh, in that part, and as a school, we'll tackle that uh, topic from the perspective of ecofeminist and intersectionality theory. <coughs> we will have a connection to Machoni. Secondly, we will look at facts and figures about the agricultural complex. We will talk about those work value features. And the third point will be uh, the environmental and social repercussions of the agricultural complex. We will quickly touch on environmental racism. And what is also important for me to clarify that in that seminar, I will not raise philosophical or ethical fundamental questions such as is it okay to eat animals? Um, if yes, what do they suffer? Should we care about their suffering? Um, in that lecture, I will introduce you to the more uh, general social, economic, and ecological questions that arise if we think of animals as food. Of course, if we have that kind of information, it's also easier to answer. Uh, those ethical questions because we're just better informed, but that's not the primary goal of that seminar. Perhaps it can be the goal of that with our chat during lunch break, I don't know. Um, then, perhaps you might wonder why I put much of me in the title of my talk. I don't know if some of you, if, if you have heard of that term before. If you Google it, you have mainly gay porn sites coming up, and that's not what I talk about. <laughs> uh, what I mean with macho is a connection between hegemonic masculinity and the con consumption of animal products. And here I will introduce you now to some classic ecofeminist theory. Um, ecofeminist theory uh, has advanced the deconstruction of hegemonic dualisms. You see um, those dualisms here in that slide, in that, well, Illustration is an illustration that has been adapted from a groundbreaking ecofeminist work uh, by a plum book, Feminism and the Mastery of Nature. So, um, these dualisms should show how Western thought or how Western society is also structured. Uh, on the left, we have culture, human, man, intersexual, white, etc. So, on the left, we have a hegemonic human sub subject that is being constructed. While on the right we have nature, and everything that is assigned to nature um, can be oppressed. So ecofeminist theory says that domination of nature, domination of animals, of women, of queer, queer people, of people of color, etc., that this domination has a common root and structure. They're all more or less interlinked, right? Can you ask a small question? Yes. Um, is it not that the concept of natural? is also uh, used in the uh, dominative oppressive way and that natural healthy can also be used as opposed to not natural, not healthy, perverted, so which would Foucault did a lot of work on this, so it seems to me that it's in a way not the same as in this. Yeah, that's, that's actually a very good, actually a very good remark, particularly well, natural in the sense of uh, traditional or the way it should be, and the rest is kind of perverted, right? But I think it would still fit. Sick also. Sick, exactly. Sick, 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 sick and healthy. Right. Healthy, yeah, natural right. is healthy, yeah. and pervert, sick, which would be good. You're right. You're right. So we could also include that here. I think it would not necessarily be a contradiction. Yes, uh, it's a different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a different take on the meaning of nature. You're totally right. Um, to perhaps illustrate uh, that connection um, on the side of the discriminated object, I have I put those pictures here, where we see how animal exploitation is interlinked with forms of human, human domination. So those first pictures depict um, dead animals or, or meat that are being compared to women, right? And so we have that connection between meat consumption and hegemonic masculinity. Being vegetarian, eating salad is said to be that these are more female characteristics or they're being gay. In Germany, we also have that advertisement that said tofu is gay meat. So real men, uh, they eat and they also eat meat, right? It's a kind of a biological meat trait. <coughs> now, as you're smiling, I think this results of you, you have heard something like that by your family, by your friends and colleagues, etc. 
But I think it's sometimes can be difficult to deconstruct that bond because then again you say, well, that's natural, uh, that's normal, that's biologic, etc. Um, when I googled naturally, apart from that, those porn sites, uh, I found that picture uh, below where you see uh, these guys showing their muscles and well, grilling that meat. And it's from a new restaurant in Tokyo, which is called Macho Meat Shop. So you know, we have these, those tough guys serving, serving, serving raw meat. Um, another case of human discrimination linked to discrimination or exploitation of animals um, is in the case of racism. On the bottom, you see a picture of a soccer game. I think it was Chelsea during the last time in or something. So you have that fan throwing a banana to a black soccer player on the field, right? So he's comparing it with a chicken mm -hmm. um, which unfortunately happens very often mm -hmm. in soccer. Then on top of that, we have a picture. It's uh, from a Swiss um, political party, actually by the biggest party in Switzerland. It's a nationalist, most successful party. And they show Switzerland, the map, and the crowds are, suppo are supposed to be foreigners that want to steal something from Switzerland. And the picture on the right is a picture of the Nazi propaganda movie The Eternal Jew, where Jews are depicted as rats, as vermin. It's from the 1930s. So, in that regard, the ecofeminist theory helps us to understand those power relationships within human society. When we have animal as a symbol coming in, and how yeah, this interrelates with human discrimination. This brings us to our second field, um, second theoretical field. So we have the ecofeminist theory and then intersectionality. Um, the term intersectionality has been coined by a black feminist legal scholar, Kimberly Crenshaw, who is still teaching at UCLA. And she coined that term in the 1980s to denote how different categories of oppression intersect. Um, for example, race and gender. So she theorized her experience of being a black woman in the US. Um, and with intersectionality, she also wanted to say that those categories of oppression, they not to simply add up, but they multiply, and that they are very intertwined. Sometimes it's very difficult to separate them from each other. Um, today, in the field of human animal studies, the term intersectionality is used in a slightly different way. It's mostly used to know that on a structural, so not on a personal, but on a structural level, how different uh, forms of oppression intersect, how they overlap. And now in that part, um, facts and figures about them are a complex, and then I want to integrate intersectionality theory and see how animal exploitation intersects with other forms of discrimination. But first, we should get to know the industrial complex. Um, I have your definition by the sociologist Richard Klein. I quote, so the industrial complex is a party opaque and multiple set of networks and relationships between the corporate agricultural sector, governments, and public and private design. <coughs> With economic, cultural, social, and effective dimensions, it encompasses an extensive range of practices, technologies, images, identities, and markets, end quote. Here we could also add Luigi Lucy's notion of uh, food as an assembly, so food not just as a mere thing, but uh, food as an assembly that assembles the farmers, the producers, the soil, uh, different identities, etc. So mm -hmm. milk and meat are never just milk and meat. Mm -hmm. uh, they incorporate well, just different agricultural inputs, work, labor, uh, different notions of gender, mm -hmm. capital, etc., etc. So this notion can also help us. Um, but to go back to complex hopes, the most important number to keep in mind is that every year 70 billion land animals are killed for the purpose of consumption. Um, this is almost 10 times uh, the human population nowadays. And until now, we've only talked about land animals. Uh, the, numbers of, the number of aquatic animals is very difficult to determine because it is only counted in tons of catch. But the current estimates go that more than 3 trillion fish are killed yearly, also just for consumption. What can we say about the history and future of meat consumption? I want to show you that slide, um, which shows the increase of meat consumption per capita from 1961 to uh, 2012, so in the last 50 years. Um, in 1961, we have 8 billion land animals that have been killed, and nowadays we are at 70 billion land animals. Um, 
And actually, the human population uh, in 1961 was 3 billion, right? So the human population doubled or tripled, while the, the number of killed animals was tenfold, or nine times. So if you look at grass, the increases took place, for example, in the US, in Western Europe, in Brazil, and also China. Um, and China, of course, also managed because of its vast population, right? This is always just per capita. Um, in the majority world, the consumption of meat and other animal products is also increasing. Um, we would say that that's because of increased purchasing power, but it's actually so just because they have more money, they have more money, but it's also due to a changed lifestyle. Meat consumption stands for a Western lifestyle, it stands for success, for modernity, and also for masculinity. Um, so meat consumption is a status symbol. Yeah. Here we have the country statistics. Uh, the world mean is 42 kilos per capita. The US leads that statistics with 118 kilos per, per capita. Italy is there at 87, so it's also fairly high. Um, China, because those people are saying, oh my god, back to China. In China, people are consuming so much meat, but it's actually still, it's just it's half of the US consumption. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. India, just four kilos. In, in India, you have between 30 and 40 percent vegetarians in the population. So that's why it's very mm -hmm. But this is also changing. Um, so, meat consumption in the minority world, as you've seen, is really on an all time high, but actually it's stagnating. Why is that? Um, reasons might be repeated food scandals, the fear of zoonosis, remember the birth flu, perhaps also new consciousness on, on health or animal welfare issues. We could also say perhaps the market is just saturated, perhaps we cannot consume more. Um, and yeah, so it's still a very insignificant trend, but also vegan and plant-based food is becoming more fashionable. Meat corporations are of course concerned by that uh, development, because the nation is well, never good if you want to expand. So they're trying to capture new markets in the majority world. And for that, they're also creating a demand where there was no demand before, for example, in India. So know how it's, it's being exported, what facilities are being exported, like stock house facilities, uh, etc. So the, the increase in consumption in the majority world is not just a natural evolution, it is a form of direct change. <coughs> the state plays a very important role too in the industrial complex because it heavily subsidizes the companies. Um, it also, of course, creates or regulates the legislation on exploiting, exploiting animals, and it also uh, heavily represses activism for animals, be it animal liberations, be demos, be it, well, legal battles, etc. Cetera, et cetera. That's very difficult. And then to come back to corporate futures, and you see here that graph, um, those frozen pork bellies, they have been traded at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange for 50 years, from 1961 to 2012, but they're not traded anymore, they have to disappoint here. Um, but other uh, animal products are still being traded, like Lihoff, futures and options, Lihoff is a specific type of hog, or milk, butter, and cheese, they're also traded. And if you don't know what pork bellies, uh, pork bellies are, that's actually what belly for pork, and you make bacon with it. Right, so that's, uh, yeah, they trade bacon. At stock exchange. Another crucial trend in the industrial complex is animal genetics and the growing importance of technology, which has everywhere. You only have a handful of breeding companies, corporations that control the whole market, and they control the whole genetic material of those animals that are being used as livestock. Mm -hmm. uh, those breeds are the result of decades of selection processes. They are highly productive, they have a very Good, as they say, feed conversion rate, mm -hmm. but they are also um, very prone to diseases. They need a constant intake of antibiotics. In the US, there are also uh, growth in sexual hormones, etc. One beautiful example for that is the breed Desjardins, and they have a natural mutation in their genes, but they're bred like, to keep that mutation, um, and that natural mutation doesn't inhibit muscle growth. So that gene would actually inhibit muscle growth, mm -hmm. but they lack that gene, so they build that bicep. 
uh, those muscles. Apart from technology, the most important trend, also as everywhere, also in the agricultural sector, is intensification and corporate consolidation in the agricultural complex. Um, the technical term for intensified animal breeding is CAFO, which means concentrated animal feeding concentration. Uh, Worldwide, the percentage of meat that is uh, produced in such CAFOs is around, is around 8%. For Italy, it's also around uh, 8%. And what I found about Italy also at first glance is that the numbers of farms from 2000 to 2010 uh, declined by 70%. So lots of small scale farmers couldn't compete, right? So they had to give up their businesses. Uh, the number of heads, the number of animals, remained more or less the same apparently during um, research of that that I'm example. But the heads per farm, of course, then had to increase. You have less farms, you still have the same, same amount of animals or even more, so you need bigger farms. Right. That's classic intensification. On this map, we see a livestock density in the European Union in 2011. The calculation is made uh, for animals that are used for meat production only, so here eggs or milk is not included, so for meat production, and it's counted per hectare of the land and livestock unit. Livestock unit is also a technical way to measure the number of animals. One dairy cow corresponds to one livestock unit, one broiled chicken, which is used for meat, is 0 0.007 livestock units. Mm -hmm. So you need a lot of food to make up one livestock unit. Mm -hmm. one dairy cow is one livestock unit, that's kind of the measurement. Um, yeah, so the density in Italy, the stocking density, so to say, is 1.46, which meant in all of Western Europe is fairly high. So we are talking about a very uh, intensified environment. If we look at that uh, map that I have uh, from the FAO, it shows poultry density uh, in 2005. And here, I'm speaking of poultry, uh, the numbers of broilers, so those broilers, broiler chickens and laying are combined. Um, red are the in intensified areas, so the areas of intensified production, and the no north of Italy is very, well, it has a lot, lots of poultry there, right? And I, I made a calculation for Piemonte, the region of Torino, and I summed up the numbers. And so only in that region of Piemonte, we have more than a billion chicken living here, living and dying here, right? Mm -hmm. Billion. A billion, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, figure with nine zeros. Mm -hmm. It's a billion, right? Mm -hmm. um, People along the way have been living here for a while, but I've actually never seen those chickens. Where are they? Right? It's a, it's a big, it's a big thing, right? Um, where are all those animals? That's a very good question. Um, well, you actually can't see them, right? Just a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of animals are actually roaming uh, on pasture, and um, the rest of them are just in those scaffolds, right? You don't see them. What does this mean uh, for those animals? Um, th their, their sort of existence um, of all animals that are being used as food, but chicken special in, in particular, so their short existence is characterized by being crammed in very small cages or confinements. Um, they, of course, suffer from chronic diseases, from self mutilation, also from psychological trauma. They never see the light of day. I mean, you don't see them outside, right? Um, in general, animals in the food industry are reduced to near bio machines, uh, and the goal is, of course, to maximize the output, be it eggs, for example, with minimum of input, and input being feed or antibiotics. Yeah. It's actually a very interesting map. You can go um, on that um, page here, and you can, you can play around with the numbers and see what's for like human uh, population density in animal. Etc. Now, as you know how the agricultural complex looks like, more or less, I want to ask the question of intersectionality how agricultural environmental destruction, and different forms of uh, human oppression intersect. 
and we will go through different environmental issues. As I've said, we're going to do ecology, so focus on environmental issues. And perhaps the, one of the biggest environmental issues of our time is climate change. Um, and I think it's a staggering number is that between 45% and 51% of global greenhouse gas emissions um, are due to the industrial complex. Uh, that's huge. Um, 40.5 is a number coming from the FAO uh, in a report that has been released three years ago. 51% comes from an environmental NGO, the World Watch Institute. Uh, the two authors of that study are actually former World Bank experts. Um, so I wouldn't say that they are the most like, radical and liberationists. Um, but we perhaps we can say the truth is some, somewhere in between. Mm. Right. Um, and even the conservative estimate of 14.5% still surpasses uh, the emissions of the global transport sector. So it's even more. The global transport sector, it also surpasses the yearly emissions of the US. If you wonder how, um, what, what kind of emissions um, are produced in the industrial complex, here again, this graph uh, is from that FAO, very influential FAO report. So 45% of those emissions come from feed production and processing, 39% of entire fermentation from ruminants, so that's their digestive process. We can just put it as cow farts. And 10% of emissions come from linear storage and processing. The transport and the processing of animals is actually uh, doesn't account for so many emissions. Other consequences of the industry are um, land system change, the industry is a main driver of land system change. Uh, land system change means, for example, the conversion of forests to agricultural land. Right? Um, the agricultural co complex covers 45% or, or, yeah, of the global terrestrial surface, which is almost half of the terrestrial surface on Earth, and 80% of arable land. And those numbers are also coming from the FAO. Um, that's really huge, a huge amount of land. And if we think of whom this land uh, belongs to, or land as commons, uh, oftentimes the appropriation, like uh, indigenous people, it's, it was land of indigenous people, and they have been disappropriated, disappropriated by the uh, livestock sector. Right? To convert uh, from the indigenous land into crop fields or into pasture. As a matter of course, this deforestation goes hand in hand with uh, loss of biodiversity. The cannabis industry is said to be uh, the, the biggest driver of species extinction and biodiversity loss, as around 70% of the deforestation of the Amazon rainforest are due to the Amazon industrial complex. Another rather high figure is that the Amazon industrial complex uses 35% of global grain harvest for fodder, and uh, that barley, we were just talking about barley before, we be trying to find it often. And that barley, oat, meat, corn could also be eaten by human <coughs> beings. It's not something just uh, non-human animals can eat, right? Soy is an oil seed, it's not a grain, so soy is not included in that figure. We have around 80% of global soy production that goes uh, directly to feed thirds. That's of course like a very yeah, shocking figure, especially if we know that uh, more or less 2 billion people are suffering from hunger or malnourishment. Of course, hunger is not just a problem of production. Hunger is a problem of distribution as well, because we would actually nowadays have enough food to feed the world. So hunger is a problem of um, distribution. It's a combination, or it's the outcome of several factors, natural factors, um, like we say, with that I mean, climatic factors, social, economic, historical, political factors, etc., etc. Et so hunger, in essence, is a political problem. But still, if we make a comparison, for example, biofuels versus animal feed, biofuels are a very a controversial societal issue, and I think rightfully so. Uh, but if we problematize uh, conversion of grains into fuel, I think we should also problematize the conversion of cheap and healthy food, such as grains, into products for a societal need, which is meat, right? Um, so if we look at meat production in 2012, we have 16% of global production that went into feed growth. In Europe, it's around 50% of wheat that is being produced that goes into um, uh, feed growth. 
why less than one percent of global production was used as biofuels. Uh, in core, you have sixty percent of global production which is used as biofuels, but sixty percent of global production goes to animal feed. And I know that sugarcane is also a, a one commodity that's being used for biofuels, but actually the biofuel industry and the animal industrial complex sometimes go hand in hand. So um, I mean. Animal industry um, clears the forest or paves the way uh, for biofuels. So first, land is being um, cleared for pasture for crop fields, and then the bio in the biofuel industry takes over and plants some sugar cane. In a similar way, um, the animal industrial complex uses a third of global freshwater resources, while two million people lack the access of water, uh, mainly in the majority of the world. You may also ask that why does the industry, I'm oh, sorry, use so much water? And I have here uh, statistics on the typical value for the volume of water required to produce common foodstuffs. Mm -hmm. um, so the production of animal products just needs a lot of water. For one kilo of beef, you need 15,000 uh, liters of water. For pork, it's much less already. So pig meat is already much less. It's around 6,000 liters. For cheese, as there for about 3,000 liters for, to produce one kilo of cheese. For bread, it's 1,600. And then uh, for potatoes, it's around 300 liters of water to produce one kilo of potatoes. And for tomatoes, it's around 200. So animal products are just very water intensive. On a more local level, if you go back to the human dimension, um, communities living close to animal factories suffer from a variety, variety of diseases, be it respiratory, respiratory diseases due to air pollution or also depression. Um, the, the link is established between living near animal factories and uh, depression. So they're suffering from mental health problems. Um, and those communities are predominantly poor communities without a say in the economic and, re and political decisions regarding their land. In the US, for example, it's also its minorities, uh, its black communities or Latino communities. Workers in the industrial complex have to perform immensely dangerous work. Um, they suffer disproportionately from physical injuries and also from psychological trauma. Uh, Soto house workers are mainly male. They are immigrants, sometimes they don't have papers. In Germany, it's a lot of people from Eastern Europe, etc. Or immigrants, people without papers, or people of color. The violence that those workers have to perform on a daily basis um, actually influences their families and the regions where they live. So, in regions where you have slaughter houses, you have an increase in domestic violence and also in, in other crimes. This thing has been studied in the US by some sociologists. I can also show you a paper if you're interested in that. As I said in the beginning, consuming meat or other animal products is linked to hegemonic masculinity. Um, also to health, as uh, consuming animal products in an excessive way can lead to various diseases like cancer, type 2 diabetes, and in the minority world, the average person is uh, actually consuming twice as much meat as is consumed as is deemed healthy by experts. Mm -hmm. So I oh know that um, social and environmental impact of the animal industrial complex is impressive, I would say. And it's enormous. I think it's really a field of study that we should investigate. Um, perhaps you might also wonder well, well why th these numbers are so crushing, why have I never heard of that before? Um, there's much talk about climate change, about taking shorter showers, not planning. Um, not taking the plane, not recycling, etc., etc., etc. But the food on our plate is not oftentimes questioned, and that doesn't only uh, refer to animal products, but food in general, also food waste, hasn't been an issue for a long time, although it's such a horrible issue, right? Um, if it comes to the animal industrial complex, we could say the elephant in the room is perhaps a cow in the room, right? We don't talk about that. Uh, the new documentary movie, How First, you see. Um, tackles that question, why do why are environmental NGOs silent on that issue? They talk about fracking, biofuels, um, fossil fuels, but they don't tackle um, mm -hmm. meat consumption. There are also scientific papers, um, 
listed one by Linnea Laestavius and others. We don't, people, we don't tell people what to do. So it's an interesting paper. Um, so why is it so difficult to tackle that issue? I think we can go, come back to our initial definition of the enemy industrial complex. Um, in the industrial complex, we just have a market set of actors involved. involved. They're powerful actors. Um, governments and business science, including universities, sometimes their primary rationale is just profit. So we have huge economic interests involved. Um, and legislation is also enshrined in law. So it's difficult to challenge law sometimes. I mean, you do the best. Um, then there are other dimensions at play, like culture, cultural, <coughs> affective dimensions, gender, symbolic power, etc. And education has become part of our daily lives, and um, it could be otherwise, and it has also been otherwise, and it is otherwise in other parts of the world also, but still something very ingrained in our daily culture. Um, perhaps also one point why the industrial complex is not really challenged is that it would demand a huge change in the minority world and in our growth-based economy. And perhaps that's also one reason that we should not start with ourselves, right? We cannot always start with ourselves. So, um, I've come to my conclusion. To wrap it all up, I hope that in my talk I was able to give you a first impression of the new field of human animal studies. And also to give you a sense of uh, complexities of animals as food. Animals as food, or not to say food derived from animal bodies, um, is to say that a sandwich metaphor, a conglomerate of gender and sexuality, remember much of much me, culture, religion, class, prosperity, and the notion of modernity. Um, the state also, as the state legitimizes and it supports and regulates animal education. Race and, and, and ethnicity, um, also racism, of course. We've got the French nationalists that are blaming um, Muslim people for their ritual slaughter, or Australia, which is blaming the Japanese for their barbaric slaughter of whales. So, animals as food are also a marker of civilization, right? Although, I think when we speak of, we had that issue yesterday, when we speak of Western civilization, perhaps we can bury that notion after the Shah, after uh, colonization, etc. Um, animals as food, of course, also include suffering, very effective and physical dimension, suffering violence for the animals, for workers and, and their families. Um, yeah, so I think we should not neglect also that emotional, physical aspect. Animals as food comprehend, comprehends their emotional, social, and environmental impact, of course, as well. And as a well, the sociologist Mary Schneider would here intervene, and she would say that animals, or especially industrial meat, should not be considered food. She has theorized the meat graph instead of the land graph, and I want to give her a final word. So I quote, she claims that industrial meat represents the diversion of calories, soil nutrients, water, fossil fuels, research funds and focus, and labor, away from possibilities of producing food and life foods for people in an equitable and sustainable way, and towards feeding corporate livestock, which in turn feeds capital accumulation. In both material sense, related to the physical use of land and resources to produce feed and industrial meat rather than food, and in an ideological sense, related to modern notions of dietary transitions that include increased meat consumption, meat is a category that relies easy classification as simply the food of food security. The space created between nutrient and energy losses when grains and proteins are converted into meat is a political space. End quote. Yeah. I guess this quote leaves, leaves room for debate. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you.